Now, Richard Wiseman talked about a few of the tendencies that um, people have who believe in the paranormal, like Barnum statements, which we're going to unpack here in a second. But I think it's important to be very clear about what we mean by these paranormal experiences and paranormal phenomena. And as Danny Kahneman said during our interview, um, it's very important to be able to recognize these, to see them in action in order to recognize them in new situations. Yep, and towards this end, you and I spent an entire day at the Mind Body Spirit Festival. We spoke to a few people there to, to get at some of the claims that are being made here and to get, get these firsthand and see if we can try and disentangle some of the general cognitive mechanisms that are operating when people are trying to deal with this stuff. Can you tell me about what you're up to here today? Yeah, what we do is um, <coughs> we give healers. So we're healers on a macro level and on a micro level. Uh, the micro level represents hands-on healing uh, to individuals. And the macro level is we give send healing out to the world. Um, the way we do that is by manipulating the universal life force or pranic energy which comes from the sun, or through the conditioned by the sun, and bring that out by, through the medium of prayer. And we can actually store that energy into physical batteries. We call them prayer power batteries. And quantify exactly how much energy is inside those batteries. And then at a particular time of a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, we can discharge those batteries through radionic apparatus, which were designed by our founder, Dr. King, um, to trouble spots around the world, whether it be an earthquake or a tsunami, uh, and so on. So that energy through these radionic apparatus can be pinpointed to the destination. So we drown it out. And from the time that those peace talks were going on, I think it was in the Hague, um, and we, we cranked up our spiritual energies well, our spiritual radiators worldwide. They're talking peace. From, yep. from, from the point of America being about to lay eggs on them and so on and so forth. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. I mean, it, it was very nasty at one stage. Gotcha. How can and, you tell though? I mean, if with that, how can you tell what the outcome was? So if you didn't have the prayer things on and they were talking peace, or, or how can you, how do you know if it's the prayer that's actually having the effect rather than just uh, well, people well, wanting to you, be you, peaceful or something Well, like that's that. right. You could turn around and say it's all a great coincidence. But we've got coincidence after coincidence after coincidence. I could give you a book full of these stories and they're before and after situations. So uh, it, we, we can track, we've, we've stopped hurricanes coming into, you know, in their formative stages. You've stopped we, hurricanes? Oh, absolutely. Oh, wow. Absolutely. And we can show you how we've done it. You can show the tracking of the hurricane coming in over the north of Australia, about to come into Wyndham or somewhere like that. And we can say this is when the SEIs were started. Uh, this is what happened. It was forecast that there'd be a Category 5 hurricane over Derby or somewhere like that and it just dissipates over the inland. Gotcha. Have you ever had the opposite though? So a cyclone comes in and you put the prayer out there but it actually does develop into a cyclone? Yes, but it, it, it's a less intense cyclone. Hi there, man. How you doing? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what you do. Well, I'm doing uh, past life regression sessions here at the festival and they're actually 20 minute sessions for people to have an introduction to past life regression. So. It's very interesting work. It's like a meditation that people go into and they're able to, through a meditative state, access a memory of one of their past lives. Can you tell me about the process? How do you elicit these memories from past lives? Well, it's really something where if we ask our consciousness to do something like that, then it will form a response. So um, what I do is I help people to get into a very relaxed state and there's a very simple process, I just do it with a door really for them to go into the past life and by suggesting that and asking the person to do that generally they find that that happens. But because I've been doing the work for 25, 26 years um, 
I'm very much aware of the, of the signs and signals when that person is starting to access the past life. So I can focus on that with them and ask questions to help bring the experience out from inside of them. We interviewed another woman called Elizabeth Loftus. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She's a memory researcher and uh, she, she seems to be of the opinion that the research suggests that much of our uh, memory, even for very recent events, uh, is quite reconstructive. So it might not be such... Uh, su the, uh, the recollections that we have might not be accurate descriptions of what actually happened. But what you're suggesting is that we're able to access memories that are uh, hundreds of years old even before we were born. Is that, is that right? Yes, and they do seem to be quite distinctive memories and if a person returns to that life there will be coherence and consistency about it as well. And the things which are you know, very convincing to people, um, like for instance, um, a person today went through a past life where at some point um, the animal that they loved very much and themselves died and, and it was just suddenly the person felt the emotion of that and they burst into tears and it's like they were so much connecting with the experience that that's what happened. Um, and that was something which they didn't really have any time to construct that. It was just really a completely spontaneous memory that, that revealed itself. So you, ta you take that sort of genuineness, that, that emotion, as good evidence that these are, these are real memories? Yes. Well, I'm a therapist, so I work to help people through this and to make a meaningful and to help facilitate a meaningful process for them. What people make of this and what conclusions they make of it is up to them. So what would you say finally to someone who's sceptical about this, who says there's very little evidence for, for past lives or, or retrieval of these things? What's your take? Come and try it. Get an experience and see what you think then. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. All That's right. great. Everything from lights in the sky to where people see craft up close, give really good close descriptions. Uh, sometimes they see them land, sometimes they see occupants getting out. Um, so, and sometimes people are having um, what they refer to as alien abductions, you know, which has been around the media for quite a while now. Um, so they're taken on board a craft and they have um, samples uh, taken from them, DNA samples and been returned. But uh, yeah, it's all sorts of things, a whole plethora of <laughs> people who appear to be extraterrestrial origin, who look very human looking, um, and they were being invited on board a craft. Then through the 90s we had the emergence of these abduction experiences where people were meeting ETs that were about three and a half to four feet tall, they had inverted pear shaped heads, large dark eyes, um, didn't really communicate much. And, uh, and a lot of those reports, people were quite traumatised by those experiences because they really were alien looking, you know. The whole thing, like rotating underneath, the whole lights flying out, all different colours, you know, like, mm -hmm. and all while this is going on, like, massive light show like I've never seen mm -hmm. in my life. Phenomenal. No sound. Just no oh, really? sound. It's like, it's like your brain doesn't compute with that when you're looking at such a f fantastic Mm -hmm. light show and performance mm -hmm. and there's no noise it sort of confuses you um, we do get astronomers who see them but you know you know in scientific circles it's not the appropriate thing to to talk about these things because you lose your funding you know so they tend to keep their mouths shut but you know there is no real classic contact as portrayed in the media or in, on you know various TV shows we've, we've always received a wide range of descriptions of beings that people are interacting with. Give me a wave if it gets a little strong. We'll try and keep it nice and controlled for you. We do astrology. And we do proper, proper astrology, I call it proper astrology. You, you probably know what your sun sign is? Yep. Yeah, what sign are you? Capricorn. Capricorn. Yeah. The only Capricorn is actually smiled. Oh, really? Capricorn yeah, here. right. Yeah, usually it's Capricorn. Anyway, when, when you're looking at a birth chart, somebody's chart, you're looking to see where all the planets are when they're born because you have a moment in time that's specifically yours, time and place. So it's based on your date, time and place. So we take a, a snapshot of the sky at the moment of your birth 
and, and from the place of birth. And then we say, well, where are the planets? What do they mean? What, is it, what kind of angles do they make? Are they all bunched together? What sign is the moon in? The moon tells us, I mean, you know your sun sign is Capricorn, but your moon sign, which is your emotional side, it's, your, it's what you need in life can be very different. So you might meet a Capricorn that, that needs a lot of sensitivity and another Capricorn that doesn't. And, and so depending on the time, the date, the place, that combination of planets says why you, Jason, are different from all other Capricorns. You've got your moment in time. What we do here is we then take basically your one of these, which doesn't mean much to most people, analyze it and we print a booklet like this, but specifically about you. An astrologer is, is an expert at pattern recognition, because I'm looking for patterns in, in, in here. So you look at that kind of pattern, you look at what sign it, something is in. So you're looking at the sign, the house, which is the part of the sky, um, and are there any angles with it? We, we do kinesiology. Mm -hmm. and so kinesiology is a modality that works with um, responses from the muscles. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Anna Rolfs, MD, PhD, did a thesis on the phenomena of the accurate indicator muscle, which through clinical trials showed the validity of unconscious responses through somatic muscles. So once you, you, you muscle monitor and tap into that level of muscle response, um, you start to actually um, access this thing which we broadly call the innate awareness. And this innate awareness can give you very, very specific and diverse information in relation to the causes of stress in, in a person's life. And that stress can be, as I said, very diverse relating to structural alignment, relating to physiological function, in relation to you know, triggers behind emotional trauma that aren't even remembered, um, and in relation to a lot of bizarre esoteric and metaphysical stuff as well. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do here? Sure. Posture Health, we're uh, doing spinal screenings to assess whether some of the people coming through the festival are nice and straight, nice and strong, assessing whether they might have any symptoms associated with their spine and then maybe give, offering them some yeah. suggestions afterwards. Cool. How does it work? Well, basically we use the SAM machine. The SAM machine is a very simple analog machine which gives us balance and we use the measurements to determine what type of shape you've got going on. From there, we can determine whether there are any weak points in the spine and then offer you some solutions after that. Now, if there's a breakdown in communication because of a subluxation, for example, the, the signals aren't getting through to the body. And before you know it, you end up with symptoms. Of course, most people go to their medical doctor to say, I have a symptom. And the medical doctor goes, well, I'm trained in medicine, so here's some medicine to fix that. It's not always appropriate. A chiropractor can get the joint free, allow the nerve to do its job, your body is an amazing piece of engineering and it can heal anything given the right conditions. In 21st century society, we don't live in the correct conditions. Yep. So we pay a service mechanic to keep us straight and level and balanced. Yep. So when you say anything, I mean, so cancer, do we have? Yeah, the body can heal anything given the right conditions. Anything from the common cold through to full blown cancer. We've just got to give it every opportunity to do that. Uh, what would you say to people that are skeptical of, uh, of alignment, of of uh, health interactions with spine. Yeah, uh, I like skepticism because it makes people think. And pe when people think, they take responsibility for their own health. There is, there is no recorded uh, evidence of a chiropractor causing damage. In fact, doctors of chiropractic are trained to heal you. And they do that specifically with the spine. Your medical doctor also wants to make you well as well but he's trained in a different area, as are surgeons. Surgeons are trained with knives and scalpels. That's, how, that's the area that they specialize in. Everybody has a specialty. Yes, there are skeptics out there. I'm okay with that. At the end of the day, chiropractors do what they do because they have a love of humans and they want to try and help them. You just have to choose which of the sciences that you want to, to use to do that. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing here today? Uh, it's a practice from Japan. It hasn't been in Australia for very long, about 20 years in Australia. Um, we wear an okaka, what's called an okakari, which is a parchment with calligraphy in it that the founder obtained. It was his way of being able to give people a really strong healing. So I'm just a vessel. I'm not doing anything. We don't diagnose. We don't ask necessarily about a person's condition. Um, so the light goes where it needs to go. The light comes through me and it is directed to the person through their forehead and the top of the head. They're the two main points that have been effective to receive the light. 
and it goes to where that each individual person needs it. So you might have a certain sickness going on, but I'm not going to direct it to that part of your body. It will just naturally go there. Okay, so where does the light come from? It's coming from the highest source, whether you want to call it the universe, God, whatever label you want to put on it, but it's all coming from the same source. Now there were several very specific claims that were being made at the Mind Body Spirit Festival. And we spoke to lots of people about prayer batteries, healing, pa memories from past lives, kinesiology, UFOs. Uh, there seemed to be several general cognitive mechanisms that were operating here throughout our conversations. And we're gonna try and disentangle those in the next section.